here. And I have her props, see? Good. Look, props. Yay, we love props. Um, hi, good evening. Hi, so glad to see so many here. I understand it's old home week that these ha these women have a fan club. Yay. <laughs> Uh, my name is Wendy Wasserman. I'm the Director of Marketing here at Politics and Prose. Uh, before we get started, we have just a few little housekeeping things that um, just need you to keep in mind. First thing, obviously, turn off your phones. That was on cue. That was the cue right there. Um, I probably haven't done it, but we're going to ask you to do it. Um, we uh, are filming tonight. This is uh, for our live YouTube channel. Hello, people out there on YouTube. Um, and we will also be posting this on our YouTube channel. Um, for that reason, when we go to Q&A, we're going to ask you to stand at this mic over here. If you can't see it, trust me, there's a mic over here behind the pillar. That way, your audio can get captured for the video, but also so Karen and Felicia can hear your question, which is actually the most important part, right? Um, and a few other housekeeping things. When we're done with tonight's program, uh, we're going to ask you to help us fold up the chairs. It's a tradition here at PMP. If you've ever been to any events here, you know we enlist you for labor. Um, but this is really important so we can set up a signing line for Felicia. Um, and lastly, uh, if you liked what you saw tonight uh, and you liked what you heard tonight, um, we have lots more events coming up. Um, there are some flyers here about what's happening the rest of the month. Uh, there's usually, if it's... If it's a day that ends in Y, there's an event here in Politics and Prose. So lots of stuff going on. Um, and oh, yes, uh, one other thing, two other points about the signing line. Um, preferences, if you're on the signing line, please, if you have a mask, to keep it on. Uh, and if you need help um, with uh, getting to the mic for Q&A, just raise your hand and we'll help you out there. All right, housekeeping done. Did that make sense? Sort of, maybe, kind of. Oh, right, the most important thing. Buy the book, right? <laughs> Whoa, that was the most important thing. So this is Felicia Corn Blue. Corn, Corn Blue, I did it right. Uh, a Woman's Life is a Human's Life. Uh, it is on sale behind the register. Buy the book, that's why you're here. That's what we need you to do. Okay, so, <laughs> but, and I just wanted to start off by saying, um, between today and it's Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday and January 20th, which is, of course, the, fifth, the 50th anniversary of Roe v. Wade, I really do consider this one of the most important weeks on the calendar for sort of American democracy and principles and all those kind of things. And even though there's things brewing that might undermine these kind of ideas, I think tonight's book uh, demonstrates how important it is to know the ideas and people, uh, both famous and ordinary, who, who really uphold these principles. So Beatrice Cornblue Braun was not a household name for me. Um, probably not for you. Uh, I think it was for these guys, <laughs> uh, being that they are her daughters. Um, as a young lawyer in New York in the 60s, Beatrice helped draft legislation which eventually legalized abortion in New York, even before Roe, so a real train, trendsetter. And uh, their neighbor, Dr. Helen Rodriguez Trias, is another name that is not in history books, not a name I knew. Yes, a name you guys knew. She was a neighbor. Um, but she took the same argument of that a woman has a right to determine when and whether she will have children to um, end the brutal um, forced sterilization that was happening around the same time and in some cases continues to happen. So during this important week, I'm really delighted that Felicia and Karen are here. Um, Felicia is professor of history at the University of Vermont with a secondary appointment in gender, sexuality, and women's studies, and an affiliated member in Jewish studies, faculty member in Jewish studies. She is the author of The Battle for Welfare Rights, Politics and Poverty in Modern America, and the co-author of Ensuring Poverty, a Welfare Reform in a Feminist Perspective. She is a former board member of Planned Parenthood of Northern New England, and currently the board vice president of Planned Parenthood of Vermont Action Fund. And I'm sure in your spare time you like save puppies or something. <laughs> <laughs> Karen uh, served as the US ambassador to the OECD. Today she continues that work at the German Marshall Fund of the United States and as chair of the boards of Radio Free Europe and the Open Technology Fund. 
she held several roles at the U.S. Uh, Department of Treasury and at the and at the Federal Communications Commission. She was then Senator Obama's policy director. So, Felicia, uh, Karen, all yours. Mike is, Mike is on. These guys are going to chat for about 30-40 minutes. Yes, okay, uh, minutes, and then we're going to open it to Q&A. Thank good? you so much. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Politics and Prose, and thank you all for being here and spending the evening of Martin Luther King Day with us. Uh, we're thrilled to have you, and I am thrilled to be uh, talking to my sister about her book. I feel like I have achieved something people can only dream of, getting to give a book talk of politics and prose without writing a book. <laughs> um, so I really, I just, I only read the book recently. Um, she didn't let us see any of the drafts. And uh, I just thought it was amazing. And I can't wait to ask her questions about it and to uh, let you all in on it. Um, I'm going to uh, jump right in. Felicia. Um, this book covers grassroots organizing by two groups of people, mostly white women in New York who were organizing to overturn um, anti-abortion laws, and then also largely uh, Puerto Rican New Yorkers who were working to overturn um, uh, forced sterilization rules. And these two groups came together in some ways, and they had difference in some ways. Just to set the scene, can you give us can you give us a little bit? Sorry about that. Um, I'm very funny usually. So, um, can you give us? Can you give us? Uh, just give us the the broad outlines of the story, and then we'll go in more deeply. Yeah. Um, and thank you, sister, for being here. Um, and thank you, some old friends and teachers and colleagues um, who also uh, made it tonight. So, um, uh, the big picture of the story is that there were two two parallel movements in New York and nationally. And those movements sometimes work together and sometimes they, they fail to work together. And in fact, the movement that we know a little more about, the movement to decriminalize abortion, um, that is to, to undo the criminalization of abortion that had happened in the 19th century, um, that movement was, was primarily a movement of, of white feminists, like my mom. And I, I honor the work of that movement and, you know, as I honor my mom's legacy and her memory. Um, and at the same time, uh, the story, as the story unfolds and we see more of uh, this woman who was our neighbor for most of the 1980s, Dr. Helen Rodriguez Trias, um, what emerges is that there was a, a, a movement that was more focused on the challenge of the reproductive challenges of women of color and working class women and poor women and single women. And, and Helen really represented that part of the reproductive rights struggle. And folks like my mother um, really didn't get it. And, and so we see what we see by the middle and late 1970s, even that, that there was even a conflict between people who were trying to um, control what they saw as an epidemic of forced or coerced sterilization, which they understood as a real reproductive rights issue. And then folks like my mom, who are active in the National Organization for Women and Planned Parenthood and NARAL, um, whose, his, whose histories I tell in the book, um, they, they even opposed the efforts to control sterilization abuse because they thought you know, any control on somebody's reproductive choices could be problematic. Right, even even a control on on people's reproductive choices that was that was intended to control sterilization abuse, they saw that as kind of a slippery slope, that that could lead to um, blocks to abortion access and blocks to access to other kinds of contraception and other things that especially women needed. So by the end of the 70s, there there really was a break in the movement that I think. In some ways, um, we haven't entirely recovered from in this movement, in the reproductive rights movement, and I say this from my Planned Parenthood board background. Um, and um, and I think it's I, so. I think that you know that conflict in that history is one that we really have to have to address and kind of get our heads around in this in this moment when we're thinking about how to rebuild. And what's so great, I thought about the book, is that you really tell it. Uh, through the, the history, the biographies in a way of specific people and specific organizations and they're each so fascinating. So tell us just at the beginning how you, how you came to the story. Um, well, 
Karen was there, <laughs> um, <laughs> and in fact played an integral role in the story. Um, so I think you know the answer to this question. Um, so, um, and I don't, I don't know how to tell the story without being without being glib or kind of strange. Um, so, um, during uh, during my nephew Eli's bar mitzvah uh, six years ago, just almost exactly six years ago, um, in the first few minutes of the Friday night service of the bar mitzvah, um, my mother had a stroke, sitting in the front row uh, in the synagogue. And she never recovered from the stroke. Um, and so um, so that was the Friday night, right? And, and the way things work in, with Jewish holidays and celebrations is you have the Friday night and then you have the Saturday morning where you have you know whatever the night is and then the morning. If it's Shabbat, it's Friday night, Saturday morning. So we were, we were back in synagogue um, after my mother had had the stroke and been placed on life support um, for the Saturday morning service. Um, and there was my nephew up there um, again on the stage. And my sister Karen was sitting on one side of me and my dad was sitting on the other side. And Karen, and I don't know what prompted you to say this, but um, uh, I, I'll ask you now. Um, <laughs> Karen leaned across me and said to my father, what was that organization mom was part of? You know, the one that legalized abortion in New York State. <laughs> And I was very quiet. And my father was, uh, was like, oh, I don't really know. And my sister said, wasn't well, it called something like the Professional Women's Caucus, something like that? And my dad was like, yeah, 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 I think that's right. So this is this conversation that's going on over me. And as a professional women's historian who also teaches on the history of law <laughs> and the history of social movements, right, I had never heard this before. <laughs> uh, and I had no idea. I, my dad, my mother never talked about it, at least not that I know. My dad occasionally would say, you know, the law that legalized abortion in New York, that was written in our living room. And for years, we were like, yeah, yeah, dad, you know, whatever. <laughs> uh, sure it was. Um, but then when Karen and my father started to have this conversation, I suddenly realized that this was, this was a real thing. Like this was, a, this was a moment in our relatively recent past that as a professional historian, historian of gender, sexuality, women, um, all those things that I should know about and that other people should probably know about. Um, but it was nowhere in the historical record. <laughs> so that's how I started to get into, the, get into the project and to really try and unearth not just my mother's role, um, which was important at one moment, but not, you know, she wasn't a famous leader in the movement, um, but even more the, the roles of all the people around her and all the people who were around this remarkable neighbor of ours as well. Yeah, it was really nice. So we, after my mom died, we called, we, I, I tra tracked down, you know, what we do in Washington, we're researchers. So I went, you know, not like Felicia's a researcher, but like Google. So, um, <laughs> so we found, I found the state senator that she had worked with and he was still alive and he came and spoke at my mom's memorial service and it was lovely. And he said the most lovely thing he said, this, was, this may have been a footnote in history, but it's a footnote that should be remembered. And I love that Felicia has taken that footnote and turned it, you know, opened it up and unpacked it and turned it into this wonderful story and added so much to it by telling the story of the, the neighbor as well. Um, so, uh, so Felicia, let's, let's keep going. And, I, you know, when I was reading it, I was thinking about um, David Garrow, who, who wrote, um, of course, the, the book about the civil rights movement, but also the book about Roe. And I know that you spent time uh, going through papers that he has and, and found evidence that I wasn't making this up about mom's <laughs> <laughs> link. Can you tell us about that? Uh, yes, so the, the, my ability to tell the story uh, depended absolutely on David Garrow's basement. Um, <laughs> so, um, so Garrow wrote uh, Liberty and Sexuality, which is kind of a definitive history of the Roe versus Wade litigation and the movement that um, generated it. Um, and uh, I had, I have my own copy of Garrow's book, but I also have my mother's copy that I found in, in her apartment after she died. And with some um, little, uh, uh, not sticky notes, my mother was not that tidy. There were, there were like little bits of random paper that she stuck in, <laughs> in a few places. And one of them was a footnote to her. 
Oh. Um, so I knew there was a piece of paper somewhere that that gave me, you know, what in my business constitutes real evidence of her role. So I contacted Garrow, and uh, it turns out he keeps everything, um, and uh, and it wound up being it wound up being fantastic because also remember it was COVID, so I couldn't go to any regular um, public archives. So instead, I made the trek, the pilgrimage, to David Garrow's house in Pittsburgh. And he so graciously like opened up his house and let me work in his kitchen and hang out with his dog. And down in his basement, I found the letter that my mother wrote to then State Representative Franz Leister, um, in which she outlined for him a piece of legislation that would have been a full repeal of all restrictions on abortion in the state of New York. Um, and that would have meant just taking it out of the, the code, out of the legal code entirely. And that was a revolution. Like no state in the United States had done anything close to that. Um, and in fact, I don't think there was any jurisdiction in the Western world that had done anything like that. But my mom, as a member of the National Organization for Women, had, had reached the point where she and, and they were demanding full repeal no restrictions on abortion, no gestational limit, no fetal viability, none of that stuff, right? No doctors making the decisions. Um, and she embodied the demand of the National Organization for Women um, and other feminists in this piece of draft legislation. You know, that wasn't what ultimately passed, right? In New York, they, they haggled and amended and wound up with something a little more modest, um, which was still the most uh, liberal abortion law in the United States before Roe. Um, but that draft that my mother sent to Leicester, yeah, there it was, in David Garrow's basement down the rickety stairs, and um, it was it, it felt like it felt like serendipity, you know, that it was there, and that somehow somehow my mother it seemed had left it for me. Oh, yeah, spooky. <laughs> um, so so tell us some more. So what passed in New York was not the full repeal, and then Roe happens. Why is it important to tell this story? Why was, why was what happened in New York at all important? Well, one of the things that I learned from this um, was, the, was the degree to which it really was possible to have uh, a revolutionary success for a grassroots movement, by a grassroots movement. Um, you know, New York now seems like a super liberal place and it seems super liberal on this issue. But in the 1960s, that was completely not true. The Catholic Church is very strong in New York, and it really had a lock on the state legislature. I mean, some people might know it took forever to New York to, for New York to reform its divorce laws, right? And people thought it, would, it might never happen. Um, and similarly, with the abortion code, it had one of the strictest laws in the United States, and it seemed almost immune to change. You know, so when the, when the movements got going, they thought maybe they would have to pass a state constitutional amendment or a federal constitutional amendment in order to change that law in New York State, right? But then what you see is, they, so they just get going. 1965 is the first uh, legislative effort to reform the abortion law in New York. It doesn't go anywhere, but it gets introduced by this um, remarkable guy from Harlem named Percy Sutton, you know, later an important Harlem businessman people might ha have heard of. Um, so when Sutton introduces his first law in 65, it's a complete non-starter. But then they win only five years later. Um, and that is an incredible testament to the power of organizing and grassroots movement. Um, and they went from a kind of despondency, which I know a lot of people are feeling on this issue today as well, to an amazing, amazing victory. It wasn't everything they wanted, but it was a huge victory. And then the New York law becomes a, a, a really important launching point for Roe v. Wade, and one that nobody ever talks about, um, and that Justice Blackmun doesn't talk about kind of overtly in the Roe v. Wade opinion, but it's all over the place. And I did a little sleuthing, you know, and kind of um, scrolled back from the footnotes in the Roe v. Wade opinion and found traces of the New York struggle um, all the way through it and found many ways in which what happened in New York set the stage for Roe. So um, I know New York is a relatively safe place for abortion these days, and sev several states are, many states are, um, but I would want to say to everybody in the United States, like, we just suffered a terrible, terrible defeat on this issue, but it is possible to win again. I think that's what this story teaches. 
So um, one piece that is really uh, interesting was the role of clergy. And um, they were really, you know, service providers as well as activists. Can you tell us a little bit about what they risked and what they accomplished? Yeah, so I, I tell the story of the Clergy Consultation Service on Abortion, which was headquartered in uh, Greenwich Village in New York and became a national project. Um, and they were for people might know about Jane. You know, there have been all those movies about Jane in Chicago, which was an abortion referral service and then an abortion provider. So the clergy service was doing something very similar, um, but they were doing it on a much larger scale. They operated nationally. They served thousands of people in the years before Roe versus Wade. Um, and they took enormous risks in helping people find safe, illegal, mostly illegal abortion procedures. Um, and uh, I think about this a lot as, uh, you know, I, I think of myself as kind of a person of faith. Um, uh, I belong to a synagogue and stuff. And, you know, when we try, I'm a member of the Social Action Committee. You know, we read books about racism <laughs> and we make casseroles um, <laughs> for people, you know, um, when they're in need. Um, but we don't, we don't risk going to jail for helping people get out of, you know, get out of our state um, in order to get a safe, le uh, illegal abortion procedure. You know, we don't take the kinds of risks that these folks took. And I think it's important... So it's important to think about what we as, as members of communities of faith or as members of other communities and community organizations, you know, what we might be willing to do and the risks that we might be willing to take. Um, the Clergy Consultation Service also, it, it, it changed completely after New York changed its law. So 1970 was when New York passes its ambitious um, abortion reform law. And then the clergy service winds up helping people all over the US get to New York. Um, because there it's safe and legal. Um, and they also opened the first freestanding abortion clinic in the United States, the clergy service do. So that also really opened my eyes. Like that's not what I, I mean, my rabbi's a nice guy. Like I, I don't think of him as, as doing that, as, as being so committed you know, to an issue, to, to um, a social change cause that, that he or that, you know, that our community would be willing to, to take you know, take that on. And yet these folks were, and I think there's so much to learn from that. And so tell us about the other, the other story in this book, the story about forced sterilization. I think most people our age don't, and younger, don't know what that means even, forced sterilization. What happened and who did it happen to? Um, yeah, people might know just, there, there have been a couple of scandals recently there for some folks who were in ICE Detention. There was a concern about people having um, sort of unwanted and, and and not consented to hysterectomies. Um, there was a scandal in California with some incarcerated women, um, but mostly we don't talk about this issue of sterilization. Uh, it was a huge issue. It became a huge issue um, in the women's movement in the 1970s, uh, especially as uh, the kind of branch of the movement that was that was oriented toward women of color and their concerns started to rise. Um, so what happens after Roe, about six months after Roe, um, the newspapers were full of the case of the Ralph sisters, these two little girls who were sterilized in Alabama. Um, and uh, their mother had nominally signed a consent form, but she, she signed with an X. She was not a literate woman. And she said that she thought that she was consenting to um, a, a reversible form of birth control, not to sterilization. So that broke, um, that broke on the national scene. And people like my neighbor, Helen Rodriguez Trias, um, got together and they formed a, a new reproductive rights organization called the Committee to End Sterilization Abuse, CESA. Um, and and they, were th they organized for the first time to fight sterilization abuse, which then, you know, once they started sort of doing the research and uncovering it, it was fairly rampant, um, but it was sort of below the radar. Um, there were a lot of Puerto Rican women, women of Mexican origin, black women, especially in the South, um, you know, poor women, um, uh, single women who, um, who were either uh, sterilized without their knowledge. This happened to Fannie Lou Hamer, the great civil rights activist. Um, it, it, it was what she called a Mississippi appendectomy. You know, you go in for one procedure and you come out with a hysterectomy. 
Um, and it happened very often to other women who would sort of be coerced or pressured into it. Their doctors or social workers or nurses would suggest that if they didn't do it, that they might lose their welfare benefits or their Medicaid coverage. Um, uh, or, would, or doctors would just say, you know, you don't want to have another child, do you? You know, you can't handle it. You don't, you can't afford it, et cetera. So, so for Helen and her organization, um, you know, the answer to people not being able to afford to have children was to help people be able to afford to have children. It was not um, to persuade them to become sterilized. So they really brought this to the fore and, um, and they were able first to win a big victory in the New York City public hospital system um, where some of the worst abuses were happening, then at the New York City level in the city council, and then they were able with allies, um, other progressive allies on the reproductive rights movement, they were able to get the Carter administration's Department of Health, Education, and Welfare to issue new guidelines for the whole country around sterilization. And interestingly, those have not been repealed. Even as Roe versus Wade has been overturned, the sterilization guidelines have not been uh, overturned or repealed. So just tell us who Helen was and you know her background before she got to this fight and how she wound up in the middle of it. Um, yeah, Helen, so Helen Rodriguez Trias is somebody who, um, who deserves a freestanding biography. She doesn't have one yet, but she, she has uh, something of a biography in this, in this book. She was a Puerto Rican doctor. Um, she divided her life between San Juan and New York. Um, she was she was remarkable enough to be, you know, a, a woman of her generation uh, as a, a Puerto Rican woman doctor who ultimately became a leader at, at the hospital at um, at the University of Puerto Rico in San Juan, and then came to New York and became a department head um, at Lincoln Hospital in the South Bronx in New York, one of the most uh, Puerto Rican neighborhoods in the city. And um, Helen, Helen wound up getting that job because the Young Lords Party, which was kind of a Puerto Rican equivalent of the Black Panther Party, had taken over the hospital. And they demanded that the hospital be more responsive to its neighborhood, to its patients. Um, and so um, Helen became uh, like a progressive feminist, uh, pro Puerto Rican, pro black chair of a hospital department in New York City at a time when there was almost nobody doing that, and she was she became one of the founders of this this reproductive rights group called CESA, and and from that point, um, she also started to theorize like what were reproductive rights, and from her perspective, it had to be more than abortion, right, more than contraception. Um, and even more than ensuring that people wouldn't be subject to sterilization abuse, right? So she and a few other people started to think about what would a kind of robust, complete, you know, really responsive vision of reproductive rights look like? And they came up with what they called the idea of reproductive freedom that, you know, today people sometimes call reproductive justice, right? The idea that people need not only the right and the opportunity to to avoid having kids, right, when they want to avoid having kids through contraception and abortion, but they also need everything that would be required for them to make a free choice to have kids, right? So of course to be free from sterilization abuse, that's the most minimal thing that you need in order to be able to have kids when you want to have kids. But beyond that, you know, maybe people need universal health care, maybe people need child care, Maybe they need safe neighborhoods. Maybe they need to be free from police violence. Right? All of those things start to be understood as part of what it is to genuinely ensure people reproductive rights. And that's what Helen stood for. And for the rest of her career, that is a campaign that she would carry all over the US. She became the president of the American Public Health Association, uh, the first Latina president. She um, represented the United States at the Cairo population meeting in 1994, and she represented that position there. She, she helped the United States actually form its policy proposals for Cairo. And uh, she was the person, sort of before our current day, who was most strongly identified with this idea of reproductive freedom, as it was called then, and then what we now call reproductive justice. So, um I want you to back up from that. I know we're going to spend a lot of time talking about that, but I want you to tell us about the Young Lords because I found that one of the most interesting parts of the book and go into you know what they wanted to see 
you know, the kind of education they did of themselves, each other, and then what they how, what they wanted to see out of the healthcare system. Yeah. Th so this is another another really untold story. Um, so the Young Lords Party is a Puerto Rican militant activist group and uh, based in New York, um, and uh, and also in Chicago, and um, they had a vision of what they called community control of healthcare. And you know, that was a, the idea of community control was very important in the late 60s, if you know, like in, in the education realm, um, the Ocean Hill Brownsville um, uh, crisis uh, in Brooklyn, for example, around community control of, um, of education. Um, they wanted to bring that to healthcare. And they said, we need hospitals that, and clinics that are controlled by the community, you know, that are responsive to their communities, where communities can can have some democratic voice. So that was when they took over the Lincoln Hospital, um, just prior to Helen being appointed there. That was the demand: community control of Lincoln, which was, by the way, a terrible hospital. It was, <laughs> it was, it was, and it was like it, a teaching hospital, right? It wasn't. It was a teaching hospital. So doctors came in for short amounts. And the, uh, you told the story of somebody who died when there was the changeover in residence, right? Yeah, there was a woman, uh, shortly after the Young Lords took over the hospital, there was a woman named Carmen Rodriguez, not related to Helen Rodriguez Trias, um, who died um, while having an abortion. Um, and it was a legal abortion, right? It was after New York had changed its law. So her procedure was totally legal. It wasn't some back alley deal. It was happening in a hospital. It was just a terrible hospital, <laughs> you know? And so what they concluded from that was that the fact that abortion had been made legal was not enough, right? Clearly, if you're going to a bad hospital, if you have, you know, doctors who change over in the middle of the summer and it's, ju it's, a, young, it's a young resident who doesn't know what they're doing, who doesn't read your chart carefully, right? Like, there are circumstances that were affecting, especially black people and Latinas, that you know that made healthcare dangerous for them, even when it was legal um, and nominally accessible, right? So that's that was where they were coming from. And within the Young Lords Party, they actually did a lot of like very profound self-education. Um, and uh, and I thought they you know they really worked on some of their sexist assumptions when they started out. They thought abortion was genocide. That was kind of the you know that was the line. Of, of black militant organizations, a lot of militant organizations in that period, nationalist organizations. Um, but the women of the Young Lords actually came forward and they said, well, no, if abortion is under community control, if it's something that somebody genuinely wants and if the circumstances are, you know, are responsive to, to communities, then, um, then abortion per se is not the problem. Um, and so the women of the Young Lords actually changed the policy of the whole organization and they became they became a really uh, progressive militant nationalist <laughs> group um, uh, you know at by the time that they sort of petered out as an organization and I think um, I think through Helen Rodriguez Trias and a couple of other people that actually had an impact a, a, a really um, unrecognized unacknowledged impact on feminism in the United States and on the reproductive rights movement. Okay, I think we are ready to open it up to questions. Um, there's a mic right here. Is that right? Yeah. Politics and prose, right the mic here. Is right here. Right here. <laughs> Hi. And again, if there if there are folks who um, who don't want to stand at a mic, you could just raise your hand too. Yeah. Hi. Thank you. Um, at the outset. You mentioned that abortion was criminalized in the 19th century, which implies that it was legal and perhaps even unregulated before then. Could you explain what the drivers were for that development? Was there a 19th century right to life movement or was there some sort of religious driver behind this? Um, that is a fantastic question. So um, in New York, abortion is not a crime. And the, in fact, the legislature never had anything to say about it until 1828, right? And, it was, and, that, and the law of 1828 was implemented in 1830. Um, and New York was early. 
So um, Connecticut was, was prior and then all the other states followed. So yes, quite extraordinary, right? Before that, there, there was something in the English common law about abortion and then the English common law gets adopted in the US and modified somewhat. So there was, there was a common law standard um, under common law, which is, you know, which is law here, um, that, um, that abortion was okay before what they called quickening, right? Before a woman could feel the fetus move, um, which as it happens is about six months, about the two trimesters of the Roe opinion. Um, so why did it change? Why, why did it become a statutory crime? Um, and the, the kind of most encompassing answer the one that kind of catches what was happening in New York and in most other states is the medical profession, the rising medical profession. Um, it became, so the, the AMA wasn't founded until the 1860s, um, but when the AMA was founded, this became a, like a crusading point for them. And even before that, like in New York, if you see who, who was advocating this um, in the New York state legislature and wha who, who were the legislators listening to, it was the kind of nascent organized medical profession in the state of New York. Um, and, um, you know, in part it was motivated by, by you could say something, something good or beneficent, like what they saw was that people were, that women were aborting using like poisons. You know, they were using various um, remedies that had been passed down or that somebody told them about or whatever. And there were instances where, where women hurt themselves or even died, right? So it was kind of a, a poison control effort, you could say, um, but it also was a bid for more power and authority by the doctors, right? At, the time, at a time when medicine is rising and the clergy are declining in influence and medicine is kind of making a bid to be you know, powerful in the public realm and not just in the consulting room. Thank yeah, you. Blame the doctors. <laughs> A fascinating book, uh, and I'm sorry I'm going to be someone who asks a question without having read it, uh, mm -hmm. but, uh, but it, it really is an interesting story. Um, so uh, just sort of telescoping out from New York, um, so I've got two questions, because since there's no one behind me, but I'll, uh, I won't ask the second one if someone comes. Uh, the first is, I was sort of wondering if you could maybe situate, um, so I was thinking of Justice Ginsburg's case when she was the head of WRP, Strzok versus Secretary of Defense, um, and uh, in that case, um, the military would discharge um, female service members if uh, they got they became pregnant, as, as you know, and um, and so Ginsburg, you know, took the case up, and uh, you know the Ninth Circuit ruled against her, and then the 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 the, 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 the D Department of Defense changed its policy before it went up to Supreme Court, um, but but basically I was wondering how was that maybe situated in if it was at all um, in the. Uh, in, in the sort of sterilization movement, was it seen as um, as 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 you know was was it situated as okay this is part of the sort of sterilization effort? Or was it you know situated more as an abortion rights uh, precedent that could, as, as I think Ginsburg planned for it to be, you know sort of set the stage in a more solid way for something like Roe versus Wade? Um, the second question has to do with uh, so Melissa Mario, a law professor at um, NYU. Um, She's on the front of the book. Oh, sorry. She's on the front of the book. Oh, oh, wonderful. Um, so I, and I'm a law professor at UVA, so, uh, you know, so it's all a, a small world, but this is not my area at all. Um, so, so basically, so she writes about how in Box versus Planned Parenthood, Justice Thomas uh, sort of seeks to leverage the, the idea of you know, sterilization for sterilization against abortion rights, right? Uh, and, uh, and so I was wondering what your thoughts are about that, and, and also how, what do you think of as the best way to address that argument in the political battles that are sure to um, be faced by the movement? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the first question is about this case that, um, that Ruth Bader Ginsburg brought that she right that she said for many years would have been a better vehicle for abortion rights than Roe. So yeah, the thing about Strzok about that case was that um, it was seen as an example of um, sort of forced abortion, right? Because a, a service a woman service member, a pregnant service member, would be discharged um, if pregnant, but would not be discharged if they aborted. So the military yet it, you know, at a time when abortion was nominally illegal, the military was actually arranging for female service members, pregnant service members, to have abortions, 
right? So it was seen as a as a kind of as a kind of forced abortion, and she thought that that would be a kind of dramatic way to, it was you know sort of like what she did by talking about men's rights as a way to talk about women's rights. If we talk about forced <laughs> abortion as a violation of reproductive rights, then maybe we could talk about the right to abortion as reproductive rights. Um, so um, I don't know if any of the um, any of the uh, anti-sterilization abuse folks um, that I write about who ever referred to that. I mean, I know I've, I, I've been in some of the papers of the ACLU Women's Rights Project, and I know that um, Ginsburg was also interested in like um, uh, bringing some kind of similar um, litigation around teachers who were fired for, for pregnancy and so on. Um, but it didn't really, it didn't cross into the anti-sterilization folks' consciousness, really. Although um, I think it's, I think it's really interesting, you know. And I think, I think theoretically, right? There's some, they, they share, um, they share something important. Now, in terms of Justice Thomas, like, I think, um, I don't know. People might not like to hear this, but one of the things that I that I did in the book. Um, and that I think we kind of have to do is we have to deal with some of the negative things that happened in the past of the reproductive rights movement in the United States. And I think many of us know a little bit about Margaret Sanger and some of the things that were problematic there. You know, she herself um, wrote and said things that were ableist and race, sometimes racist and so on. Um, but beyond that, even much later than Sanger, um, you know, I found, for example, that um, uh, two out of the three um, uh, founders of NARAL, the original people who met in the original very tiny committee to make plans to form NARAL, um, had really problematic beliefs, and they were committed to what they called population control. Um, and one of them, this guy named Garrett Hardin, was, uh, you know, in, in his later life was somebody who was... Um, uh, called a fascist by the Southern Poverty Law Center. Um, and, you know, I think we need to think about some of those, some of those origins. Um, and Planned Parenthood itself was very much opposed to the effort to control sterilization abuse. And, you know, at the very least, um, really not getting it about some of the, some of the needs of uh, women of color and poor women. So, um, I think if we don't, I think if we don't do it, then Clarence Thomas does it, basically. <laughs> And that, you know, and there, you know, of course there's a difference. And Melissa Murray is really great at saying this. There's a whole heck of a lot of difference between forced sterilization and abortion. And people are not being, comp you know, giving people uh, autonomy in their reproductive choices is not the same thing as forcing people into, you know, into abortion or anything else. However, I think if we don't, you know, if we don't kind of clean house and take our own history really seriously, then I think we are exposed. Um, you know, I think that's where the story of Helen comes that's in where the story because of Helen she comes can in. integrate those. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but thanks for asking that. Helen. Thank you. I, I just had a simple question. When you said that the, it was a, the law was a victory for a grassroots effort, I was just wondering, what what did they do? How did they accomplish this? Oh, good. Well, I should have asked that. <laughs> <laughs> um, that is a good question. So um, they did everything. I think of it as the like leave it all in the field strategy. So my mom, she's, she's trained as a lawyer and so a somewhat moderate person. So she drafted this legislation. That was what she could do as a lawyer, member of the abortion committee of the National Organization for Women. Um, other people who were on that committee and which then becomes a freestanding kind of lobbying organization, they lobbied. They lobbied like mad. They pressured the Democrats. They were, in fact, they were part of a movement to reform the Democratic Party and to pull the Democratic Party sort of toward the, the feminist and civil rights left, right? So they work within the Democratic Party. They pressure people who are moderate on abortion, who want a moderate reform, and they organize in their districts, you know? They, they make sure that people will be there at every district meeting, district level meeting. Um, and then there are other feminists who, um, who are associated with the women's liberation movement, you know, a little younger than my mom and a little more um, radical and confrontational in their tactics, right? So they organize the world's first speak out and people start telling the truth about their illegal abortions. Um, they break up uh, state legislative hearings. They shout down the legislators because the legislators 
are not being you know, progressive enough on these issues. So they do it. They, of course, they picket and they petition and they do those kinds of things, but they also push harder. They even, like, they pressure the doctors. They pressure the AMA to change its policy because the doctors traditionally were, you know, were, were the ones who had made abortion a crime. So they, like, invade the AMA convention, <laughs> you know? Um, they, they do it all. Basically, and, and one part we didn't talk about is um, this is especially relevant in light of the last question. There were a lot of African Americans, women and men, who were part of that. Can you just punctuate that? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. This is, so this is not a white only movement. The the National Organization for Women was, you know, ma certainly majority white, um, but at its founding, there were also a lot of um, black women who came from uh, the labor movement who were leaders. There were uh, black feminist theorists like Polly Murray, who was involved in the National Organization for Women at its very start. Um, Flo Kennedy, Florence Kennedy, who was a very important uh, black radical feminist attorney, was involved in NOW and helped bring the first federal litigation um, that centered women um, in the abortion issue. So yeah. And Percy Sutton. Oh, and Percy Sutton, of course, from Harlem. Um, and other Harlem Democrats who were the first ones to really, you know, take a risk on this issue. Yeah. Thank you. Hello. Um, so I just had one quick comment, and then I have a question that has been partially answered. But anyway, I just wanted to add to the comment you made a, a little bit ago about how uh, doctors were the ones making um, abortions illegal. And it was specifically because they were, to my, it's my understanding that they were, very interested in getting into the business of obstetrics. Like that was a new specialty that they wanted to control. And a lot of the purveyors of these potions that you described were often midwives or other uh, prof uh, medical professionals who they didn't approve of and considered competition. So that was just, it was specifically this obstetric um, prof um, specialty that they um, were trying to promote. But my question had to do with, um, with the relationship of organization, like you, you just described your mother's activities and other different groups who are working on this issue. Um, and I'm just wondering what their connection was to second wave feminism. And do you see this all emerging directly out? You, you talked about, you know, the transformations of the 1960s. And do you see all of these efforts, like your mother doing the legal piece and other people doing these other pieces, do you see them all with common intellectual roots? Or do you see them sort of coming from different paths and converging on this one issue? Um. You mean all of the different actors who um, who stood for reproductive rights? At yeah, times. like do they come from a similar intellectual root, and then, or do they come from divergent roots and then converge at this moment in like around 1970? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Well, first, I'll just say that um, this woman is a pr professor of history at George Washington and knows what she's talking about when she says that the doctors are trying to get into the.
Should we, politics and pros, should we let them have one more question? Or should we need to start signing? Should we do that and then do signings? We can do that? Okay, all right, I'm just following orders. Please go all ahead. All right, pressure is on. So I'm trying to imagine what dinner conversations were like when you were growing up. <laughs> so your mother is an activist, a professional, and yet years later, in the crossover conversation between you and your father, you don't know various aspects about your mother's activist past. So how does her biography and your lives fit into the story about what you were told, what you were not told, maybe why you weren't told it, and are there family papers? Uh, is, there, mother... is there a therapist in the house? <laughs> <laughs> All yours. <laughs> can I can I start though? Yes, please. Um, so one, so I, so both our parents were really sort of. In, we didn't think of it this way, but grass evolved in a grassroots way in New York City politics, which was just teeming. You know, there were there was an independent Democratic club on every corner um, that came out of the uh, Eleanor Roosevelt sort of reform school, and so my dad was the one who was much more overtly invo involved in all that and a politician when we were growing up. And so he he ran for, he beat Jerry Nadler for district leader, <laughs> lo lost to him for assembly, unfortunately. He succeeded Elena Kagan's father as head of the community board, and they all fought Donald Trump's uh, efforts at um, developing the Upper West Side together. Um, so, and my mom was really involved with him, but, and I think this is, this would be part of my answer, I don't know if it's Felicia's answer, but my mom was really caught up in this crucible of being a working mom. Mm -hmm. And it was damn hard and, and uh, she was very ambitious, she always wanted to be a judge. Uh, she, I think she thought she might get there through my dad's activism and she didn't. Um, I mean, she, she wound up being very happy, but she, it was, it, so sh her career sort of took a, her, her politics took a back seat. Um, and, uh, and that's, you know, so I think we didn't, t and I think, you know, I think we all have to think about this. I don't think she thought of it as, because it didn't lead to this and this and this, and she didn't become head of an organization. I don't think she thought of it as a huge accomplishment. Mm -hmm. But you, you give the historian's answer. No, that's, that's great. Well, my first thought when you say what were, what were, what was, what were things like at the dinner table um, is that I, I have an image of my mother saying, a million times, you don't understand. They were butchers. <laughs> they were butchers. You know, she was so she was fiercely committed to this issue always. And the other thing that I talk about in the book is my mother's perennial cry: "Don't go to a Catholic hospital. They don't care about the women. They only care about the fetus." You know, it's like, you know. And um, when you're a kid, it's a little bit embarrassing to have that conversation over and over again. But I, but I I got the message right. She was fierce about the issue. But I didn't know that she had played any kind of a, a leadership role. And she, I guess she didn't think it was anything to really brag about. I also didn't know, and I found this out after she died, and, and we have a few family papers from her, that my mother had what she referred to in a letter as a D and C, right? Dilation and curatage. Then that was it, often a euphemism in the 60s, right? <laughs> For an abortion, right? right. Some yeah, people right. remember. Yeah. Um, but my mother, for all that she was so fierce about this issue, she never said she had an abortion. Um, and it could have been a DNC for some other reason, right? It's also, if you have a miscarriage sometimes, right? But it was probably a legal, what was then called a therapeutic abortion. Yeah. But she never, never mentioned it. I literally didn't know until I, I looked at this letter which, in which she also talks about my own birth. Um, <laughs> and she's telling a friend that before my, my twin sister and I were born that she had had a D and C. <laughs> so I think, I think there's something about women's history and the failure of family policy that, that shaped shame. that. And shame. And shame, maybe, yeah, yeah, yeah. My mother also, she was constrained by the Hatch Act. You know, she was a federal government employee. She was a, an attorney with the National Labor Relations Board. Uh, and, m and making a career at the NLRB, she felt like she was at risk of losing her job uh, as a federal employee after the Hatch Act, which forbade federal employees from engaging in overt political activity. So that's another, like, real historical yeah, yeah. thing that got in the way. Yeah. It's deep. Uh, I'm just curious. Uh, Karen, why did you... Here, here, here. Why did 
did you uh, make that comment to your father? <laughs> Which oh, one? I, oh, 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 why did I say that? Yes. Oh, you know, when your mom's dying in the hospital, you have a lot of memories flashing, and you want to think of her biography, and I was filling it in in my head, and I, I assumed we all, that was part of our common history, that we all knew that mom had done that, and I was just trying to fill in the name of the organization. Um, but I think it was partially Felicia's re reaction. Uh, I don't know what it was, but it forced me to go, you know, to the Google and start digging and finding articles about. Well, I didn't. I'm you all knew, but I didn't know about New York State's um, history in overturning its anti-abortion law. And so I started to learn about that and figure out who it had first introduced it. And I think Dad told me about Franz, the state senator. And so we found him, and he filled in some more. Um, but I think I thought, I think it was part of our sort of, you know, you don't bring it up because you think everybody knows it, family history. So, but don't buy the book because you're delving into our family history. <laughs> buy it because it's a really interesting book. <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of interesting characters. Uh, is a very light reception downstairs if you want a glass of wine or a little bit of coffee. Help us fold up the chairs. That would be terrific as well. Thank you so much. For Did you want your book virtual? Sure. Under what name? Just a signature. I need a name.